we're here with uh, Bond Royalty, a very esteemed guest, uh, John Glenn, and this is Johnny. Hi. Um, so yeah, we'd like to ask John a few questions about his career in Bond. Um, five films, we're not sure if that will ever be matched. So, John, what's um, if you could pick one scene that showcased, showcases your skills out of the Bond films that you directed, what, what would you pick to say this is what John Glenn's all about, or a secret? Well, strangely enough, I think it was a film that Lewis Gilbert directed when I did the second unit on. Uh, it was The Spy Who Loved Me. And of course, that's the ski parachute sequence where the Union Jack um, up reveals Bond uh, escaping from the jaws of death, shall we say. And uh, that was Cubby Broccoli's favourite sequence scene. And uh, that was my most successful action scene I think. Okay. Um, I went out to uh, Mount Asgard in the Canadian frozen north, a uh, very difficult location and uh, Rick Sylvester was the stunt man involved who looked nothing like James Bond, he was about five foot six and bespectacled and quite studious looking guy but uh, of course when they're on their own there's nothing to relate to his size, he was well proportioned and therefore when we dressed him up in the proper wardrobe he, he passed the bond very well. Um, but he, he was an amazing stuntman and uh, he called himself a ski bum really. He, was, uh, he used to do the stuff for fun, you know, jumping off mountains and things. And uh, he showed me some footage um, that was shot in the Yosemite National Park and uh, he, he leapt off this mountain top and uh, he went down like a sack of potatoes. He looked awful. <laughs> and when I questioned him, he said, oh no, if I had the right facilities and a helicopter to get us to the top of Mount Asgard, he said, and bring my own mountaineers and that. He said, I'm sure I could do it to your satisfaction. So this is what we did. But uh, with three weeks and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars later, we actually had managed to achieve that that sequence. Yeah, of the five films that you did, which one would you say you're most proud of as a sort of finished product? As a finished product. It's a toss-up between um, *License to Kill*, funny enough, and *Octopussy*. *Octopussy* is really my favourite because it had all the things I love animals, and uh, they're. The circus gave me a perfect opportunity to use animals in, in the film. Snakes, um, the girls, the um, you know, to, to storm the fortress at the end of the film. Uh, I used all these acrobats to do various things. It was novel and it was new. Um, I can't think of any other film that used animals the way we did. And it led to some very amusing incidents. We were filming in, in India and the scene called for a tiger to confront Roger in, when he's in the, in the jungle escaping from uh, the villain and uh, we couldn't find a tiger anywhere in India. I'm sure there are some but they're very hard to come by. Um, so I uh, went to having one evening we went to the Maharaja's palace for drinks and when he greeted us in his palace, I looked over behind him and there was a stuffed tiger. So I said to him after the introduction, can I borrow your tiger? And he, he was quite amused by this and he said, oh, absolutely. So what we did, we put the tiger in a stuffed tiger in a wheelbarrow and got the prop man to run through the bushes with it. And that sufficed for us to, to get that part of it with Roger on the location. And the rest we did back at the studio with um, with uh, Jimmy Chip, um, Chipperville, was it? No. Uh, anyway, it was um, it, he he had um, several tigers which we brought onto the stage at Pinewood and and uh, very carefully <laughs> shot the rest of the scene with the tiger. But um, no, it was, it was uh, interesting. John, you, you screen tested a few people when Roger was kind of, is he coming back? So you tested Sam Neill, mm -hmm. um, James Brolin, yeah. Pierce Brosnan. Who was your favourite? Who was your n number one choice to replace Roger? He was a very difficult act to follow. 
Roger. <laughs> you missed, Mr. Bond. Did I? Yeah, it's always it's it's a big leap to to um, replace him. I, I quite honestly, I thought that um, that Timothy was a very good choice, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a very fine actor. And he he he, when we'd approached him many years before, I don't think he was quite ready for the role. But now he'd matured a lot, and um, he was very keen on going back to the original Fleming style. And he had he had the acting ability to pull it off, so I was very pleased with uh, with Timothy. And uh, maybe the subjects we chose because he he had that in his armory that acting ability. Um, maybe the drug license to kill the drug background to the film was very hard, and we had to be true to the story. And uh, it did hurt us a bit at the box office because. It was a 15 certificate, if I remember rightly, which excluded the younger children who'd been used to Roger Moore stuff. I want you to know this is nothing personal. It's purely business. Uh, I remember at the golf club one day, uh, one of the members came out to me. He said, I was cursing you the other day. He said, I went to see, took my young son to see Octopussy. I think the kid was about 10. And he said, and when the octopus um, during the fight sequence latches onto this villain's face during the fight sequence, he said, my boy ducked under the seat and hid his eyes. And afterwards he said, Dad, would you take me back to see it again? Because I really want to see it. You know, he said, I had to go and see the film three times. <laughs> he said before the kid eventually looked at it through his uh, through his fingertips. You know, um, so that was good for the box office. <laughs> Um, of the films you didn't direct, which of those did you look to for inspiration or are there any that are personal favourites? Yeah, well I think the best, the, the, some of the early ones with Sean were really good films. I thought From Russia With Love was wonderful, wonderful supporting cast as well. And Guy Hamilton directed Goldfinger beautifully and I think it was one of Fleming's be better books, uh, Goldfinger. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. I remember reading it on holiday years and years ago and I uh, couldn't put the book down. It was, you know, it was so, uh, such original stuff and very well directed by Guy Hamilton, who was a bit of a wartime hero himself. Um, so, you know, it was, yeah, very, some very good stories out there. And, of course, they had the advantage of having the pick of the Fleming books. Um, but I think From Russia With Love was the big step up from Dr. No. Yeah. Because they didn't really realize on Dr. No what they had. I remember Peter Hunt telling me that, that he and Terence Young were watching the, pro the press show in town, uh, the first screening of Dr. No, and the critics who in the audience all started laughing and uh, Terence Young got terribly embarrassed he, he, he couldn't understand why they were laughing because they were making a straight thriller and suddenly there's all this humour coming out and so he left the theatre before it finished Spectre? Spectre Special Executive for Counterintelligence Terrorism, Revenge, Extortion The four great cornerstones of power headed by the greatest brains in the world and Peter had to ring him in the evening. He said, go out and get the papers. They're all raving about this new style of British humour. Tongue in cheek. How did it happen? I think they were on their way to a funeral. And Terence later said to Peter, Knowing what we know now, how are we going to re reproduce this in the next film? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so with Roger, he was. Um, he, there's often been talk about he didn't want to kick the car when he sends Locke to his death, and he was a bit critical of the um, the mine massacre in A View to a Kill. 
How much convincing did he take to be a bit tougher? Was it a big discussion or did he quite go quite easily with it? Well, Roger, you've got to say, he's, it was an absolute fantastic professional actor. And at the end of the day, he would always, the director is the boss on the film and mm. uh, you discuss these things with the actors. And I certainly discussed the, the kick in the car off where Locke is in the car. Roger wanted to use um, a little dove emblem as a sort of a, a make weight. He throws it in the car and that little tiny little thing is enough to send the car <laughs> over the edge. And I said, no, Roger, you've got to kick this villain. You, he killed your best friend at, in Cortina and... I said, you, you've just got to kick him off. I said, that's what you would do. You left this with Ferrara, I believe. And we did not have an argument about it, but we had a kind of disc long discussion. And in the end, I said, well, I tell you what, you can throw the, the, pit, the tie pin in and kick at the same time. <laughs> so that's what we did in the end. It was yeah. kind of a compromise, <laughs> but it worked. Everyone we've spoken to and, and reading about Roger, everyone seems to love the guy to you know to get on with him incredibly well. But he does allude in his books to the fact that he didn't always get on that well with Grace Jones during <laughs> View to a Kill. Could you shed any light on that? Well, they share they they um, they were in adjoining dressing rooms, and I remember very well. She used to play loud music on a ghetto blaster. Right. And this used to get on Roger's nerves. And one day he'd had enough and he stormed into her dressing room, grabbed the ghetto blaster and tried to destroy it. <laughs> and they had a sort of a fight, you know, but it, you know, it was a kind of bit of a fun thing, really. Uh, so it was, a, you know, he was annoyed, but, but this persistent music came, because that's Grace, you know, she's, She's um, quite a character. Someone will take care of you. Oh, you'll uh, see to that personally, will you? I found I found her fine, actually. She's, you know, she was very uh, sort of dominant personality, and uh, but she was fun. I got on very well with her. In fact, I, I I used to I used to worry she would chase me around the corridor sometimes. She was quite a character. <laughs> yeah, we've heard some stories. Um, one of the most talked about subjects on for Bond fans only is the possibility of a black Bond. Do you think that would be too much of a shift, and the public wouldn't welcome it? And also, who do you think should replace Daniel Craig? Have you got anyone in mind who you'd like to do it? Well, I, there's no reason why a black person uh, couldn't play the role the way things are changing anyway in this country I mean it, it was it wouldn't have been acceptable probably five years ago but now it's become more of a possibility yeah um, you know it might be the sort of change it needs I don't know mm -hmm. uh, but um, I suppose uh, Idris Elba is, is the name that comes up all the time um, might be a bit getting a bit too old for the Yeah, part. he's kind of 44 now. You know, because you've got to think ahead of maybe three or four films, so you, you're thinking about seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Roger was getting too old, really, in, in View to a Kill. He was showing the, you can't <laughs> stop the clock, can you? And uh, <clears throat> with all the, you know, makeup and everything else, there are times when you can see. And don't forget that when I got my first break on for your eyes only and my first instruction was to find a new bond and then we, I went on and did three with Roger thank goodness because he was such a help to me um, I mean that whole opening scene in for your eyes only uh, at the uh, graveside of his wife uh, Teresa he, uh, that, I wrote that scene pu purely uh, to remind people about the history of Bond, for a new to introduce a new Bond at the graveside, and uh, when Roger got the role, it was such a good sequence, we we kept it in. 
um, get the idea in. It seems that, you know, despite certain obstacles and things getting in the way of the franchise and various problems with studios, that it just seems to keep going. It seems to be like this sort of unstoppable train. And I just wondered what you thought was responsible for the longevity of the series and why it is as successful as it is. Well, I suppose, you know, in the early days of, of Bond, um, they used to have these exotic locations in the Caribbean and so forth. And remember, uh, in, nine, in the 60s, early 60s, people didn't travel like they go on package holidays everywhere. It's fairly something that's developed over the years. And probably Bond has something to do with that because people would go and see these lovely Caribbean exotic locations and palm trees and beautiful blue turquoise seas. And, you know, it got them out of their everyday lives, so the routine, you know, suddenly there's a bit of escapism here and you go and relax and watch a Bond film and uh, it's got a magic to it. Um, particularly, I think, Morris Binder's sort of opening title, you know, with the, the guy getting shot. He even start and John Barry's music, it kind of invokes a, a feeling of, you know, expectancy and you're, gonna, you're in for an eye for, you know, <laughs> something unusual. And of course the action is everything in a Bond film. I mean, uh, you don't go to watch a Bond film for the dialogue, do you, or the story necessarily, it's just the, the experience. Uh, so that's why I think they'll always be popular. Um, you know, they're not, not to be taken too seriously, um, but they're just a bit of escapism. And uh, of course, nowadays we're running out of locations. Where haven't we been? You know, they've been everywhere. <laughs> um, some of the locations have been absolutely fantastic. I mean, I think one of the most interesting ones was Iceland, funnily enough, in View to a Kill. Uh, that sequence there with the, the mobile um, iceberg. Um, I remember that we, I think it was Hobbs, uh, Mike, was it, whoever made that, one of the boating companies on the Thames, um, made up this iceberg out of fiberglass. I remember going down to Sunbury on Thames and uh, try, doing a trial. Mike came out with his, his iceberg and we trialled it on the Thames. And it was quite interesting to see all the people who were walking their dead dogs on the bank looking around and see this motorised iceberg going along. And it wasn't April the 1st. <laughs> well, um, there's been rumours about Dalton coming back for it would have been kind of 1992. Talk about robots and Hong Kong and, and then going a bit lighter. What, do you know much about Dalton's third, the plot or anything? No, not really. We hadn't got that far. I think um, I think there was a kind of, a, there was some litigation going on, um, you know, with, um, they had all kinds of legal problems. And so there was a kind of a, a big gap between Dalton's second film, uh, License to Kill, and the, the new one. I mean, he was signed on. He was signed up to do a third one. Uh, and then it was put back and put back. And I think it was probably three or four years before they made uh, they made another one. I think it was probably six, five six, years, six, six years, years, was it? I know it was a long time. So by that time, all the old guard, if you like, um, Dick Maybaum, myself, lots of people, writers, and technicians and that we six years down the track you know um, everything changes so they had to more or less start again uh, but I was only ever employed picture by picture so you know it was no great surprise to you know after a six year gap that they chose someone else and I think it was a wise choice <laughs> Me. During the mid '80s, obviously there was the um, the Battle of the Bonds, and there was the the McCrory rival uh, mm. film, Never Say Never Again. Yeah, yeah. Was there a consciousness on set during Octopussy that there was this sort of rivalry, um, sort of rival film being made with Sean, um, and was that sort of feeding into the work you were doing on Octopussy? Or strangely enough, not. Um, we never really had any fear about. Uh, you know, people have tried to imitate Bond in the past. Um, Americans tried to do it with our man Flint, and that was a flop. And 
they had a, a, a female Bond, I think, they made years ago, and that didn't do very well. So no, we, we weren't worried at all, and uh, we were making Octopussy at that time, and we were fully engaged with doing that, and, you know, with all the animals and the circuses and so forth. And in fact, um, uh, on the Kevin McClory film, Never Say Never Again, or they had they had a Rod, uh, they had uh, Sean Connery, which is a great coup, and that's why it was called Never Say Never Again because he's he was saying he would never do another Bond, yeah. and uh, of course you must never say never never say never again. Um, but uh, he, you know, he was their biggest asset, if you like, with that film, and then of course we had Roger who was well established by now as Bond, so we didn't really have any. In fact, while they were shooting, uh, they sent the, the labs, the film laboratories got mixed up with the tins of film, and uh, one day uh, into my cutting room came their film, several, <laughs> several reels of their rushes, and uh, we didn't open them and look at it or anything. We, in fact, we paid for the car to take it out to Elstree where they were filming. So we had good relations with them we didn't uh, uh, you know there had been bad feelings I suppose you might say between uh, Sean and Cubby I think Sean you know I felt he, I think he felt he hadn't been paid enough or something I don't know but uh, and it, but every time we met Sean would come and have dinner he'd have lunch in the, when he was doing Outlander I think we we were in the, in the commissary at Pinewood and Sean came by and everything was very cordial and he sat down and he, he joined us for lunch. So, you know, but all the, you know, you listen to the press, they're, they're all the, it's good, it's newsworthy, isn't it, to bring a bit of confrontation into it. Um, but, uh, yeah, there was, yeah, they, they were cordial. Are there any scenes out of the five you directed that you'd go back and reshoot or take out or you were kind of a no regrets man? Well, I mean, <laughs> making a Bond film, it's like, um, it, it's, it's got a life of its own, in a way. You know, you start off with an idea, you develop it. Um, there's a lot of discussion with the writers and what have you, so it's very difficult to say you do anything differently. Um, I mean, one of the best parts of filmmaking is actually the writing, you know, where you, you know, when, when, when you're actually in on the blank page, and and you 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 develop the action sequences and you go on the records and you get ideas from what you see and then you can adapt it to the to the actual screenplay. Um, no, we had great relations with with Michael Wilson and and Richard Maybaum and uh, Cubby would come along. We'd have these script conferences and they were very amusing. Dick Maybaum always used to write the leading lady as his his wife who was like 70 odd years of age and very, very attractive woman in her time. And uh, Dick would, um, would, he used to be an actor, he started off as an actor, Richard Maybaum. And he would get down on one knee and make this passionate plea for, you know, a speech that the leading lady was gonna make. And it was so funny, we'd have some fits of laughter. Yeah. Um, obviously, pre-Bond, you'd already been involved in some massive films, um, The Italian Job, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, Superman. How did you sort of get to Bond? How, what was your sort of journey? Well, it, it all started with um, Peter Hunt, who was a friend of mine, and we started off in 1946, I think, in Shepparton Studios. He was a junior assistant in the cutting rooms, and I was even junior. And uh, our careers sort of uh, went in different directions. And he uh, became an editor before I did, and then I became an editor, and then he got the chance to work on the Bond films with Terence Young. And uh, he, he was an amazing editor, Peter. And, uh, he introduced a new style of editing, you know, it's a sort of shorthand you know, a look towards the door, and then you cut out into the corridor, and Sean Connery would be walking along the corridor. It was kind of unheard of in those days, so we used to make time, you know, he, he would, it would just be the, the, the important bits that would be portrayed, you know, all the mundane, boring bits would be cut out, and he had this style, this shorthand style of editing, and it was very, it works very well on the Bond films. 
Um, anyway, he, he got the chance to um, direct on the Magister's Secret Service, which is probably one of the best books, if not the best book, that Fleming wrote. And uh, he got into a bit of trouble um, in Switzerland. The, they had very bad snow conditions. There wasn't any snow, and then it did snow, and then they couldn't move because <laughs> they had so much snow. And the Bob Run sequence, which was a very important scene in the film, probably the biggest action scene in the film, um, was melting now. The sun came out and the, the ice was melting and it became dangerous. And it was important imperative to get on and shoot the scene quickly. And Peter was thinking, I need another director to go out there and direct the... And he thought of me. He'd been watching my career blossom, if you like, doing TV series like Danger Man and what have you. And uh, he, he thought of me and he, I got a call. I was working on the Italian job, actually, towards the end of... We were in the dubbing theatre and I got a call from Pinewood and they said, oh, would you come over and see Peter Hunt on the set? And Peter Collinson, who was the director of the Italian job, he said, oh, he said, they're going to give you a job on the, on the new Bond film. I said, I doubt it. He said, oh, I'll ring up Harry Saltzman. So I said, please don't, please don't. <laughs> and he did, he rang Harry Saltzman and gave me a big push, you know, and not that it meant much, but... I went over to the studio and uh, and Peter Hunt was directing Diner Rig and George Lazenby and he said, Won't be, I'll be with you in a minute, John. He said, read this sequence and he opened up the script on the Bob Run sequence and I read it and he came over after he'd finished the scene and he said, what do you think? Would you like to direct it? Uh, of course I said yes and on the following Monday I was on a plane flying first class to Switzerland and a whole new career, if you like, on the Bond film. So that's how it started. And I made a big success of the Bond run. We managed to shoot the Bob Run sequence. I had to do it very quickly and I had to improvise a lot. Um, we would put these big sun sails on the, all the critical parts of the course to stop the ice melting. We put these shades to keep the sun off it. And uh, I started off by taking the, the, the shades down while I was shooting, and then time got so desperate, and I said, leave them up. <laughs> and it made the course look twice as long, because suddenly it was changing, you know, from some had the shades up, some had the shades down. But it worked. Well, on licence, obviously licence kill was a very, was a big shift in tone, and it had to be cut down to be a 15. Um, were you kind of... Obviously, you you were aware that you was making this shift in tone. Were you kind of worried about how that would be perceived and how it'd go down at the box office at the time? Well, I, I think in answer to that is I think we were relying on uh, Timothy Dalton's acting to to win the day because it was a it was a good story and it was coming up in the news all the time now about these drug parents and what have you. Um, we knew there was a bit of a danger, but. These sort of violent films were becoming quite, quite um, popular. At the time. Um, trying to think of the of some of those films, uh, Die Hard, the Die Hard films, were be very successful in America and what have you. So we were kind of following, in a way, following that trend. Um, we used to try and keep up with the times, you know, and be topical, you know. Yeah. And uh, but there's always a danger, you know, when you change course, you go from something very light and you know almost you know the villains were almost comic cut characters, weren't they? And then you're suddenly into a real life drama with these ruthless drug barons. And Darby, I thought, was fantastic in that role because he played it with such a such humour, and you know it was it was a man who one moment one moment would order the death of people and the, and the next breath he is charming and mm. you know suave we tested them actually in in uh, in Cubby's house we we were testing girls and we dressed Robert Darby up as James Bond and he wasn't half bad I tell oh, okay. you yeah he was good um so Sort of bring this to a close now and, and bring it up to date. What is your sort of opinion and thoughts on the, the modern output and the, the Daniel Craig era? 
Yeah, well, as I say, I think the Daniel Craig films are very good and been very successful in America. They seem to have been accepted. That kind of harder edged film seems to have been accepted now in America, whereas I didn't seem to accept it with Timothy, although the rest of the world seems to have done. And I think License to Kill has become more popular uh, over the years. I think people realise, I mean, the tanker ch ch chase is a fantastic action sequence. And the girls in that, to Lisa Soto and Carrie Lowell, beautiful girls. Um, and uh, we shot it in Mexico, which was, you know, was pretty hard going at times, you can imagine. Uh, just after the earthquake they had there. I mean, when we first went there on the recce to Mexico City, the, I mean, the um, skyscrapers were leaning against each other. You know, they were all condemned and uh, it was very difficult. Cherubisco Studios, where we shot it, were, was falling apart. <laughs> and the first explosion on the set, all the um, lining in the, in the ceiling came down like autumn leaves <laughs> while we were filming. <laughs> uh, but it was a, a terrific experience. and. Mexico, they're pretty good filmmakers there. They make some good films and they've got some very good actors. So my experience was very good there, really. As I say, there's a lot of corruption. Uh, we had an instance where we needed guns for, obviously, for one of the scenes. And we had to bring them in from Los Angeles. And uh, they got through US Customs fine. But we got to the Mexican end of the, of the Customs shed and uh, uh, they said, uh, no, we're not allowing these guns into the country unless you pay us $50,000, corruption, you see. And Tom Pevsner, who was a producer, associate producer, he said, I'm not paying it, I'm not paying it. And they said, if you don't pay it, it's going up $20,000 a day until you do. So he had to pay it. And plus. <laughs> so it was quite corrupt and... Uh, uh, but the the people are lovely and the actors are great um, and of course the weather was fine for us as well and Mexico City is a very interesting city. John Webb, on behalf of Kabon fans only, can we just say thank you very much for taking pleasure. time out to speak to us today? Yeah, it's been fascinating listening to you and um, you're um, you're very well respected on the group. Everyone loves your films and the. Yeah, the diversity of your film. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you.